Hi, my name is Joe Zrelowitz, and I'm here to present our AskBoss 2020 paper, Pronto, Easy and Fast Persistence for Volatile Data Structures. This is work that I did with Saman Mamaripur and Steve Swanson while at the University of California, San Diego. So the motivation for this work is the arrival of new non-volatile memory devices. What's interesting about these devices is that like DRAM, they're byte addressable. We can use them as main memory within, within a computer. And they have performance characteristics that are on the order of DRAM. They're slower, but, but not incredibly slower. Unlike DRAM, but like disk, these devices are non-volatile. That is, their contents will survive a power outage if we, if we suffer one. So what's, what it seems like these devices are a really good opportunity for is fast durable storage. That is, we have fine-grained access to reasonably fast uh, storage. So this is how we are currently integrating non-volatile memories into, into machines. So on the left in the orange, what you see is kind of a traditional machine architecture in which we have uh, a bunch of volatile devices, those devices whose contents would not survive a power outage if we were to suffer one. So this is the, the CPU, which interacts with, with the caches, and then the caches are going to communicate with DRAM, the DRAM controller and the actual DRAM DIMMs. If we add non-volatile memory, um, we're going to add it at the, with the non-volatile memory controller and then the actual device. And if data reaches the controller, well, at this point, it will be persistent. That's going to survive a power outage. So this is cool, but the problem is that data is persistent once it leaves the caches. That is, once it hits the non-volatile memory controller. But, unfortunately, the programmer generally doesn't control the order in which things are evicted from the caches. So if he has a bunch of modifications that he expects to become persistent, the cache eviction policy might reorder those writes such that what actually resides in persistent memory is not all of them. And so at a crash, it's actually very likely for a persistent state to be corrupted, as we're missing some updates which uh, some of the, the data that actually made it to persistent memory is relying on, unless we do something. So we need some sort of system that allows us to consistently update our non-volatile state, that is our persistent state. So this is generally the job for things that we, we term failure atomicity libraries. And if you're familiar with software transactional memory, this is basically software transactional memory plus durability. So uh, we can identify particular code regions, which we'll call transactions, and all of the rights within a transaction should become persistent atomically. That is, all of the rights of the transaction are going to survive a power outage or none of them. So for the example where Bob is paying Alice $50, uh, we're going to decrement Bob's account and we're going to increment Alice's account. Um, and it should never be the case that money leaves or uh, gets added to the system. The problem with failure atomicity is that it's expensive. So there's a performance overhead and there's a programming overhead. So the performance overhead we can see um, Intel's PMEM KV, which is kind of an industrial strength key value store that resides on Optane memory. If we strip out all of the failure atomicity code, it'll run 1.5 to 2x faster. This goes to show that like a large portion of the work that it's doing is actually maintaining um, a consistent persistent state. And then the other piece of this is the programming overhead. We looked at how would we take a particular failure atomicity library, in this case, Intel's PMDK, and add it to a, a commonly used key value store memcached. And this required changing about 1500 lines of code in order to do this, assuming that we did we did everything correct. So obviously the programming overhead is not only in terms of work, but also in terms of the introduction of errors. So our solution that we're proposing and that we're uh, presenting here at AskBoss is called Pronto. And Pronto uh, is a transform that allows us to take a volatile data structure and turn it into 
a non-volatile data structure, that is a data structure who maintains its contents in persistent memory and who would be consistent in the wake of a power outage. Pronto requires minimal code changes in order to take a volatile data structure and turn it into a persistent data structure. In fact, for sequential data structures, it's a black box transform. For concurrent data structures, it's slightly more complicated. We need one line of code per public facing API map. So the other piece of Pronto is that it's, it's fast. Pronto works by moving the cost of durability and consistency off of the critical path so that, and does it concurrently with all of the operations that are actually going on within the data structure. So this allows us to save a lot of the cost of adding failure. So I wanna cover kind of a, a brief design overview of Pronto. Pronto has effectively three components. It has the volatile online image. This is um, volatile, so it's lost on power failure, but this is like the original data structure. In fact, it's almost exactly the original data structure. It resides in DRAM and it's part of Pronto. The next piece is asynchronous semantic logging. This is our logging scheme. And we use this logging scheme in order to, to recover the volatile online image in the wake of a, of a power outage. And the final piece of Pronto is periodic snapshots. These snapshots allow us to truncate the log and to prevent the logs from growing indefinitely. In order to explain the Pronto design, it's easiest if I start with the logging scheme, our asynchronous semantic. So asynchronous semantic logging is a type of operation logging, and it enforces failure atomicity for data structure updates, that is effectively writes to the data structures on, on methods like put and insert. We actually don't have any overhead or instrumentation for read-only operations, things like get. In asynchronous semantic logging, we have two threads. The background thread is responsible for logging. So it's going to log both the operation that was invoked on the data structure and the arguments um, with which this method was called. This is all it logs. Meanwhile, in the foreground thread, the foreground thread is executing the actual operation on our volatile copy, our copy of the event. These two threads synchronize at operation begin and end. And so the guarantee is by the operation end, the operation has both been con conducted on the actual, on the, sorry, on the volatile online image, that is the copy and DRAM, and also the, the operation, the method call and its arguments have been logged into persistent. If at any point we need to recover because of a power outage, well, we don't have the volatile online image. What we do, we replay the entire log on a new volatile copy in order to recover the state of the volatile online image at precisely the point of the crash. Okay, so the two other parts of the Pronto system are the volatile online image and the periodic snapshots. I'll go into the online image. The volatile online image is a copy of the original data structure which resides in DRAM. It's in fact, the original code almost. It's um, the only change that we're going to make to the online image is that we're going to add a custom memory allocator. Our custom memory allocator uh, allows us to track the modified pages within the data structure so that we can more easily snapshot it um, periodically so we don't have to keep track of all of the operations that have ever been invoked on the data structure. It turns out this is pretty easy to do for SDL containers because there's a template argument to give the data structure the allocator it's supposed to. The other piece of our design is the periodic snapshotting mechanism, and the periodic snapshots are used to truncate the log. The snapshot is conducted by copying the entire data structure into non-volatile memory, and we use page permissions in order to track which pages are actually part of the data structure, and we just copy the dirty pages into, into non-volatile memory. And we can do this more or less asynchronously with the operation of the data the data structure um, in the foreground. So here's an example of the, the Pronto system working. 
Recall we've got three parts of the Pronto system. We have the online image, which is volatile, that's the left-hand side, and then we have our two non-volatile parts, the log and the snapshot. So we start with an empty data structure, as you can see, and we're going to um, start by inserting A. So here's A, we've inserted into the data structure, and while we are inserting A into the data structure, we're also logging the fact that we inserted A within our log, and this is our asynchronous semantic log, and these two changes happen concurrently. Okay, so we're going to do another operation on our data structure. We're going to insert B. So we're going to insert B on the actual data structure. We're also going to log the fact that we inserted B. Similarly, we can insert C, both on the volatile online image and within the log. At this point, we'd like to take a periodic snapshot so our snapshot goes in two steps. So the first is to copy the entire data structure from DRAM, that is volatile state, into persistent memory or non-volatile state. So first we can do the copy. The data structure at this point has been replicated into persistent memory and will survive a crash. And then we can truncate the log because we no longer need the semantic log in order to recover our data structure. Um, at this point, we can continue processing on the data structure, so we can like insert D. Notice that we've added D to the data structure, but we've tossed most of our log. At this point, we just have the insert D within the log. If at any point we want to recover, all we need to do is take the most recent snapshot and apply any operations that have not yet been applied to the snapshot to that actual snapshot. At this point, we've recovered our data structure at the point of the crash and we've recovered. So I told you that Pronto is easy to apply and so I wanted to demonstrate exactly how easy it is. This is a Pronto version of the STL vector. This is in fact the entire code you need in order to take the STL vector and make it into a persistent data structure that is a data structure whose contents will survive a power outage. Okay, so how does this work? So the first thing to point out is that this is a wrapper class. So we've got pronto vector, which is a wrapper around a vector. The wrapper class is going to inherit from persistent object. This is uh, part of the pronto interface. It allows us to track all of the methods within the class so that we can hook them into our semantic logging and also allows us to assign a name to the particular data structure so we can find it after a crash. The next thing we do is we hook the allocator for our STL container to the Pronto allocator. This allows us to track the size of the data structure and any dirty pages so that we can efficiently do the snapshots. Okay, so that's all initialization. Now let's look at how, um, how we would hook into the Pronto runtime once we start modifying this data structure. So for every public facing method, we need to wrap it with two method calls. The first is opbegin and the last is opcommit. Opbegin initializes the logging operation. So it says for this method, on the top it would be push back, the bottom would be pop back. We're going to log the fact that we did this operation and if we have any arguments we need to pass them to opbegin. So you see at the top opbegin takes the value which is what push back is called with. And we're going to perform the operation on the wrapped vector, and then we're going to finally commit telling Pronto that the operation has completed. And this is a synchronizing call between the background thread and the foreground thread. Now both pushback and popback are updating operations. They modify the contents of vector. If we have something which is a read-only operation like size, what you'll see is that we actually didn't need to instrument the size method at all. We just need to wrap it in order to expose it to the, within the, the classes API. If you're interested in how we support concurrent operation or concurrent data structures, you'll need to take a look at our paper. It's more or less along these lines with some, some slight complications. So our evaluation, we evaluated our code on real Optane memory. We had a machine with 192 gigabytes of DRAM and one point five terabytes of non-volatile memory per socket. The first marquee result is comparing prontoized SDL maps and SDL hash maps to Intel's PMMKV. This is an industrial strength 
key value store written for Optane memory. And what's great is that our prontoized STL map and our prontoized STL hash map outperform PMMKV about, by about, or up to 4x. Um, we think this is a really great result because it demonstrates that with very little code, we can get really good performance out of existing well-tested code. And we still get persistence. The other marquee result I wanted to share with you is comparing Pronto versus RocksDB, which is another key value store. RocksDB has two persistence options. It has a synchronous and asynchronous mode. In the asynchronous mode, it's allowed to lose some recent operations as it's going to have kind of a batch commit strategy where uh, it's period periodically going to write back any recent operations into persistence. So an inopportune crash could lose some operations as opposed to the synchronous mode, which is really what Pronto offers where every operation is immediately persistent. What we see is that we get asynchronous performance with Pronto with synchronous guarantees. So our synchronous performance with Pronto is as fast as RocksDB asynchronous mode. If we compare apples to apples, Pronto is um, three to four X faster when running in synchronous mode than RocksDB. So in conclusion, what did we, what did we demonstrate? So we showed that, well, okay, so our problem was that adopting failure atomicity is expensive. There are overheads both within performance and programming. And our solution Pronto solves both of them. We give a black box transform of volatile, volatile structures to give them persistence with minimal programming overhead and our system actually achieves excellent performance. Thank you very much for listening and take care.